okay, that's probably enough. I just, I can't wait. <laughs> so, hey, thanks for, for joining me today. Um, I, this is going to be a little bit different because uh, Code Wednesdays, we can actually try some things and do some things differently than we might normally do otherwise. Uh, I'm going to cover some uh, some some material on our socket, uh, as you might have guessed from the title, our socket wrench. Hand me that spanner. Uh, so, our socket is something that that the more you learn about it, well, the more I learn about it. I, I won't speak for you, but the more I learn about it, the more excited I get, the more possibilities I see opening up. And even from the get go, there were there were a lot of. Um, hence is probably too light a word. There were a lot of indications as to the potential, the power that, that our soccer could bring to bear on problems. And I don't want to go too far back. I mean, the, you know, there are other sessions that I've done that I kind of lead in from zero, right? Build up from, uh, from, from starting from scratch and, and building a blocking API and going to a, a reactive streams publisher based API, and then going over to our socket, I'm going to skip right to that our socket step at this point with this, and then we'll do some things with that. And then we'll take it in some maybe different directions. <laughs> Why not? Right? Uh, that's the fun of code Wednesday. So uh, to start off with, I guess just to as a very quick uh, review, uh, blocking APIs typically, if you look at, let's say, returning a value or a uh, from a method from an API call, typically you'll return a value, an object of type T, or a a an iterable of some kind of type T, a collection, a list, what have you. Uh, so that's fine. That works. And if that gets the job done, if it answers the mail, if your applications are are working well together and scaling fine, that's fine. That's great. Congratulations, you're done with that particular problem and you can move on to a different domain and solve a different uh, set of problems. So that's fine. Uh, however, uh, many times scaling is a real issue and Reactive Streams addresses that by handling those interactions and allowing your, your distributed system, your, your system of applications to scale well within an application uh, primarily, uh, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, because you're not uh, you're not blocking when you're you're requesting let's say a, a, a set of values uh, and maybe that's a very small set it doesn't matter right you're only getting five values but maybe that's a very large set a large number of values I should say just to be you know less ambiguous but if that's a very large number of values and perhaps you don't even know the extent of the number of values maybe it's five five hundred five million you don't know that or maybe it varies dramatically. Uh, you don't want to block until that last value is received before you provide any kind of value at all to the consuming service, the end user, or, or wh whoever is downstream from that particular service in question. So um, Reactive Streams publishers come into being, and again, I don't want to get too far down in the details with this. There are many other talks that I've given and other uh, good folks have given, uh, and, and they address these particular issues. But, but Reactive Streams publishers give you, give you the ability to scale. They also give you uh, the ability for a slower consumer of those values to apply some pushback, or as it's typically called back pressure, right? So um, to, to step back a moment, instead of returning an object of type T or a, an iterable of type T, you would return a publisher of some form, which can be zero to N values. Now within Project Reactor, which is a pivotal lead effort, but obviously it has a lot of industry uptake and acceptance and, and endorsement. Um, but we specialize publisher into a mono, which is an object, well, basically equivalent to an object of type T. It's, it provides zero or one value. Uh, or you may have a flux, which can provide zero to N value. So it's more like that iterable, right? You may have no values coming back, or you may have a small number of values or a large number of values. But the nice thing about a reactive stream is that you, when the values start coming back, you don't wait for that five millionth uh, value to come in. You, you start feeding those values back, or potentially you can start feeding those values back as they come in. You also, again, as I mentioned, have back pressure. So if you have a slower consumer and that consumer you know, says, give me all your values, not realizing there are 5 million values that are going to be coming back, uh, that consumer could die. But with a reactive streams approach, that consumer can say, give me 10 values. I'm on a slow connection. I'm on, on slow hardware. Just give me 10 values and I'll process those and I'll request more. So I stepping aside from, uh, you know, how you address the, the you know, the uh, potentially the, the disconnect there, you, you're still maybe producing 500, 5 million values. Uh, but again, you have that control in your cloud-based service far more than you may have in a distant, far distant 
uh, potentially at times connected, at times disconnected uh, client application, consumer application. So um, again, gives you more capabilities. Now, the, the nice thing that our socket does is it builds on the reactive streams constructs and particularly the project reactor constructs the the fluxes the monos and it allows you to do some really cool things when you start connecting applications this way so let's connect some applications let's build a couple and let's connect them and then let's kind of see I, I think it's far more instructive to see uh, what happens than it is to just talk about it right now i already feel myself speeding up because i get really excited about this uh, I, i'm trying to calm down i'm trying to take it nice and easy but again, there's no set pace, right? So <laughs> we can do what we want here. It's Code Wednesday. Uh, and I again, I get excited and, and I tend to kind of, um, I don't know, it's, I, I think you'll see the, the same thing. It's the possibilities are just excellent. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to create a couple of Java projects using Maven as the build system, the current version of Spring Boot. I'm going to change the group to the hecklers.com because, hey, that's my domain. Why not? Right. And I'm going to create a um, uh, R socket server. Well, let's just spell it out. Our socket server, uh, and that's fine. We'll use jar packaging, of course. Why wouldn't you? Uh, we we'll use the current LTS version of Java at this point in time, which is 11. And I'm going to just pull in some uh, some very simple dependencies, and we're going to keep it keep it lean and mean today. Uh, so I'm going to start off with reactive web. Uh, and that gives us the ability to build reactive web applications using Spring Web Flux, which is based on Reactor, again, uh, and Netty. So that's good. That's a start. I'm also going to bring in R socket. It would be kind of a silly, uh, silly uh, R socket session if I didn't bring in the R socket dependency and allow us to use R socket. And then Lombok because I'm feeling lazy and I'm not using Kotlin. So uh, Kotlin gives you the ability to, well, do several things, but the, the I guess the, the gateway drug, if you will, for Kotlin is that uh, it allows you to, to vastly streamline your code, especially, but not limited to, domain classes. And Lombok helps you do that in Java as well. So <coughs> pardon me. All right. Now I am going to cover, you know, probably a lot of ground very quickly. There are a lot of things that perhaps I could cover or that I think of later and I wish I'd covered and that's fine. Um, come back and see me in a month and we'll, we'll talk again and maybe I'll just take things in a slightly different direction. But, uh, oh, I did want to say, uh, RSocket, you do not need to create a Spring Boot application to use RSocket. Uh, in fact, let me, uh, let's see, RSocket... Yeah, there we go. So uh, again, application protocol providing reactive stream semantics. Uh, so nice. So it allows you to to set up a client to server and server to server communication, which I'll get into momentarily. That's a little slightly misleading after you establish that connection things. The rules change for the better. Uh, again, it's a binary protocol for use on byte stream transports, such as TCP, WebSockets, Aeron, and, and more, potentially many more in the future. So it's, it's rather protocol independent, right? Um, transport independent, I should say. Uh, and it's language independent because uh, you, well, well, here's a great example, Java, Kotlin, JavaScript, Go, .NET, C++, and probably more again down the road. Uh, we're going to be focusing on Java and the, in my opinion, the easiest, best way to consume our socket, to work with our socket, and to build these R socket pipelines is using Spring Boot. And as you might imagine, right? That auto configuration does amazing things on your behalf and I'll point them out as we go. So I'm going to generate our R socket server project. I'm just going to uh, dump that on my desktop and I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna do, going to also create a client. And again, this is uh, for the beginning phases, right? Because once that connection is made, those distinctions somewhat disappear. I might as well talk about that while I'm opening things up. Because once that connection is made, you know, obviously somebody has to be listening for connections. Uh, but once that connection is made, there is no distinction, no practical distinction between the, the original client application, and the original server application. Communication can go, can originate either way. Now, I do want to back up and start here, I guess, with, with applications. Because uh, what I want to do today is to take... Uh, take three different applications. And one is just to provide an API to pull live data. And that's that's my, my plane finder application, which ties into a, a small device back here on my desk, which actually uh, listens for aircraft in my area. And, and aircraft position reports come in, and we're going to be consuming and showing live data. Now, you know, this time, in this strange time in which we live, uh, you know, traffic air traffic numbers are, are down somewhat. And of course, I just have a small device with a small antenna, so it only pulls in, you know, a very limited number, but it's real data. So I, I always, 
enjoy when I can see real data versus just generating something, which, yeah, it's generating's fine. I have a backup in case nothing's flying over at the time. Uh, but really, I mean, it's just cool to see who's who's up there, right? So, okay, so this is our, our API we're exposing. Very simple API, and this is what, where we're going to start right here. So I, I actually have defined this as a controller and not a REST controller, but I'm providing the response body, which is uh, what, a, what REST controller is. It's a convenience annotation that includes at controller, at response body, and kind of wraps them into one, right? But I'm going, to, um, I'm going to just use this, and I'm going to hit that aircraft endpoint. We'll come back to this other one momentarily. Uh, but for now, let's, uh, let's start with this. So I'm going to, uh, let's just close that. And I'm going to open the application properties and the uh, the code, the main application class, and then close that out. We don't need that. Now, how do you create an R socket server? Well, it's really, really tough when you're using Spring Boot. It's super tough. It's just so difficult. I'm going to just designate the server port, and I specify a property as a server port. And the and, and Spring Boot's auto config says, look, you're specifying it. You have the R socket dependency on your class path. You are specifying an R socket server port. I bet you want to create an R socket server. So let me do that for you. It's so, so nice. So yeah, that's pretty tough, right? And I'm also going to specify a server port. It defaults to 8080, but I'm going to keep things consistent, make this a 9090. The R socket server port is 9091. So it keeps things rather orderly. Orderly is good. Now, huh. Let's start off by by defining. Well, let me let me just, yeah. Let's 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 start with a um, controller here. Controller, and we'll call this our server controller. And let's let's start off by kind of stepping through the models that our socket supports. So our socket, um, in an HTTP based environment, typically you'll have some kind of of support for a request response, right? Makes sense. You issue a request, you get a response, life goes merrily along. Uh, within uh, HTTP, you can also issue a request and get sent back, well, really more like uh, uh, reactive streams. You can request a, issue a request and get back a stream, right? Uh, and then of course, uh, our socket recognizes those as valid interaction models. Makes sense. I mean, we've used those extensively, both in the uh, blocking imperative world and the uh, reactive world, and that's fine. But we also there are other couple other reactive, uh, or excuse me, a couple other interaction models that make a lot of sense that our socket supports. So something like a fire and forget, because that allows us to send a value from another uh, another application, another service and just absorb it, right? Not send anything back. Nothing is required. Nothing is expected coming back. And that is a valid use case. Makes a lot of sense. We do that quite often. And most of the time when we have a request response, we just send something and we just get a disposable response. We do something with it. We ignore it. We, you know, have to deal with it. But, uh, you know, it makes sense to have a fire and forget. So uh, we also have a, a interaction model for a bi-directional, directional, directional channel, which is super useful as well. Now, <clears throat> let's start off with this and I'm going to keep things, um, you know, again, pretty simple, but I need to be able to pull or I want to be able to pull aircraft information. Now, if I go over here and I go to my, uh, my aircraft domain class here, we can see that we're getting a lot of information, at least potentially. Sometimes all the data doesn't come through, depends on what's fed, but we can potentially get a lot of information from that little device, which is getting information from the, the transponders of various different aircraft. So we have the call sign, the squawk code, the transponder code, the registration number for the aircraft itself, the flight number. So if it's a Delta flight or a Southwest Airlines flight, it has a, an assigned flight number for that airline. Um, if it's assuming it's a commercial flight, if it's a, if it's a private flight, obviously, flight number may be empty anyway. The route, so if it's going from Dallas to St. Louis or, or JFK to LAX, uh, it'll show that. And, and if there are any you know stops, so, so it's JFK to Denver and to Denver to LAX, then it'll show that too. The type of aircraft, the category uh, of aircraft, the altitude, the heading, the airspeed, that's very important. Uh, the selected altitude. So if, if we uh, skip over vertical rate, so that's the climb rate. Uh, the selected altitude. So if they plan to fly that aircraft, that flight at 40,000 feet, uh, but the current altitude is 20,000 feet. It's climbing, right? So the vertical rate may be, you know, 2,000 feet per minute. Uh, so, so these numbers may differ, but they're both important, at least potentially important. 
the position, the latitude, the longitude, the barometric pressure, uh, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of things here that we don't necessarily need, at least for our particular domain. So I'm going to streamline this just a little bit. We'll create another aircraft class, which is technically an aircraft position class. So it's the current position as reported by the aircraft and captured by my little plane finder device back here. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to keep it, uh, as I mentioned, simple. So we'll, we'll just grab the call sign, the flight number, and the registration and type, type, and we'll uh, let's see. Well, let's let's pull in the altitude, altitude, uh, the heading and the airspeed, and also let's see. We'll do a we'll do the position. So latlon, and that's good. Again, using Lombok, so I'm going to keep it lazy. Make that an at data class, so that gives us the ability to uh, to just uh, create those classes. The the at data does the uh, provides the getter setters equals hash code and two string methods for us. We don't have to code those. A lot of boilerplate that we don't have to look at and examine each time. So, okay. Now, how do I get at that data from our plane finder application? And the, the way I'm going to start off with is just to create a web client. And this is our reactive web client. And let's see, I'm going to do a web client dot create. And we're going to point this to HTTP colon slash slash localhost where it's running, not localhost, localhost. <laughs> and we're going to point this to 7634, the port it's running on and the aircraft endpoint. And that gets us started, right? The reactive web client works with reactive and non-reactive uh, blocking endpoints. Uh, but that's, it's just kind of the Swiss Army knife of uh, clients. So that's, that's a good place to start. Now, um, let's see. So request response. So we need to be able to satisfy a request and provide a response. Now I'm going to just feedback a single aircraft in this case. So I'm going to return a mono of type aircraft. And again, mono is that reactive streams publisher type that has zero or one values. It's capped at one. And again, there are some operations that make perfect sense for all kinds of publishers, monos or fluxes in the in reactor parlance. But there are some that make sense only when you're dealing with one value, potentially one value or potentially a lot of values. Uh, an iterator might be a great example uh, of, of some type. So, uh, you know, we want to be able to distinguish between those and this is a great way to do it. So we're going to return a mono of type aircraft, get, well, let's, let's just make this request response. And we're going to receive something as in, in the manner of a request. So I'm going to just make this a, a mono of type instant because that way we can get a timestamp, right? Because we can find out timestamp, timestamp when we receive this request. So let's see, I'm going to grab this timestamp mono and do on next, do on next. And I'm going to take that timestamp and we'll just print this out. Now I'm going to, um, I'm going to expand this a little bit or while, while we're doing this. I like to do this. Um, so yeah, this is this is actually uh, I'm gonna make this a, a little bit brighter. So let's see if I can find. Uh, yeah, there there's a nice red clock. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend you uh, you litter your uh, your um, logs with uh, emojis. However, for the purposes of a demo, this really makes things stand out. So it's a little easier, well, significantly easier to see what's happening. So I receive a timestamp. I'm just going to uh, log that right, and then. Uh, then I'm going to use a then operation, which expects a mono. Now, how are we going to create and provide this mono? I'm going to use the client uh, to get and retrieve a value from our from our plane finder application here. I'm going to use the web client as it's defined. I'm already pointing to an endpoint. I don't have to add a, any kind of URI um, uh, restrictors or const, uh, descriptors. <laughs> Talking is hard. I uh, need to stop and wet the whistle a moment. All right, refueled, ready to go. So I'm going to convert that because I know it's going to be returning a flux. If I look here, I can see this. I'm getting a flux of aircraft. So that's zero to N aircraft, but I really only want one. It's okay. I'm, I know I'm going to be getting back multiples. That's fine. And then I'm just going to take the next one and that returns a mono of type aircraft. So that's, you know, that's pretty simple, right? So I'll just move that over here. So we have our R socket server. It's ready to return a response at the prompting at the prov providing of a request. Now, what I actually should do at this point is go out and open up my RSOC client project and let's create an RSOC client so we can we can play. <laughs> All right. 
So let's bring that over there, close that, and open up our application properties and our application code. I'm just going to close this dot get ignore and we're in business. Okay, so what do we do here? Well, the, for starters, I'm going to uh, just define uh, once again my class aircraft and private string call sign flight no reg and type private um, int altitude heading and speed private ah uh, let's see this was a double lat lawn and once again we've got at data oh I, actually i i need to do one other thing here because uh here i i'm going to be getting potentially a lot of fields as you saw that i don't want to have to deal with i don't care about those extra fields so i'm just going to ignore properties and that sets us up nicely for that. Okay. There we go. Okay, we're back. Now, what I like to do, what I what I need to do is create an RSocket requester here. So I'm going to create an RSocket requester bean. I can do that here because the Spring Boot application allows you to define uh, bean creation methods, but I typically like to create just a separate configuration class. It's I feel like it's a little cleaner. It also makes things a little easier when you start testing, and testing is very important, right? We I'm just blasting through code today. But, uh, but obviously, when you're writing production applications, do not scrimp on the testing. Uh, and this kind of keeps things clean. So this will be our client config class, and we're going to create a bean method. So this will create an rsocket requester. We'll call this method requester. And of course, we actually, just having this on the class path, we have our rsocket requester builder bean available. So let's use that, return builder.tcp. Now remember, I mentioned that you can actually uh, define connections or RSocket requester connections based upon TCP, Aeron, WebSocket. Uh, we're going to start with TCP here. We're going to point to localhost. And again, we're running our server on port 9091. So we're going to use that. Now, um, I'm going to keep this really, again, streamlined and simple for what I'm going to do because I'm going to go crazy in different ways today. So we're going to keep the basics pretty basic. So I'm going to create this and this will be our client component. And let's see, so uh, let's start with a post construct method and we'll just do a request response. And actually I need to inject my rsocket requester so I can use that. How am I gonna do that? I'm going to use Lombok, again, lazy developer. With an at all arcs constructor annotation with Lombok, that instructs Lombok to create a constructor with a parameter for each member variable present in that class which we have one. So add all arguments constructor means create a constructor with an argument or a parameter for each one of these. In this case, an rsocket requester and voila, we're done with that. We've got our, our rsocket requester injected into our component. So I'm gonna use said requester and I'm going to define the route. Did I define a route over here? I did not. Well, that's going to be kind of important. And we, <laughs> we define that route with a message mapping right so i'm going to say this is a request response mapping i'll restart that once again helps when you have everything in place i told you i get excited and i i just want to skip to the end and i i sometimes skip over things so if you catch it let me know if not hopefully i will request response and if if, if not hopefully it'll st still work or we'll be able to figure it out pretty quickly so i'm going to point to this same route right so i'm going to hit this r socket uh, server to try to connect. I'm going to use this route and try to uh, to connect via this route, right? And I'm going to provide some data. Now the data is optional, but I like to provide this timestamp. So again, we can see what we're doing. And this is exactly what we're expecting in our server. Uh, we're expecting that timestamp to come in. So then I'm going to retrieve well, I actually know I'm going to be getting back a mono, right? This is the whole API. This is a mono of type aircraft coming back. So I'm going to grab this mono of type aircraft. And then because this is a reactive stream, I'm going to subscribe to this. This is a publisher. Setting aside the fact that you can have hot publishers or cold publishers, typically you have, by and large, most of the time have cold publishers. And why is that important? Because a hot publisher, while it's very important that you have that capability at times to where they can continue to throw off values as they're pre produced and created, in most cases, the vast majority of cases, it really makes no sense to provide that capability, consume and, and generate and, and use that, those resources if no one's listening. 
right? So if nothing's logging, if nothing's connecting, if nothing's requesting, why would you consume those resources? So most publishers are cold publishers. They don't do anything until someone subscribes to them and says, give me all you have here. Or give me the next 10 values there or, or what have you. So we're going to subscribe to that. And we're getting back an aircraft and let's just, uh, let's just print that out, right? Uh, so we're going to uh, take our aircraft and I'm just going to use airplane and yeah, we'll take this airplane. Come on. Oh, Mac's a little slow. I think I must be taxing it or something. So uh, we have things in place. Let's go ahead and start this and see what happens. Time for a drink of coffee. And this is why I like to use emojis, because uh, when you're trying to show something and make it a little clearer, it, it just pops a little better. You can see that little aircraft right there. Yeah, so, so we have one aircraft in the area that I'm pulling in at this point. It's a PA-31, so it's a Piper Aircraft uh, 31, Model 31, and I don't remember what the actual name designation is on that particular one, but we see here that the uh, the national registration number in the U.S. is 59906, and it's on a heading of 232 on the compass, which is southwest, right? A speed of 178 knots airspeed. And it's at a position, an exact position at the time of reporting uh, of this latitude and this longitude. So yeah, it's some interesting information. So that's our request response kind of in a nutshell. Now I'm going to go ahead, we, we have that. Let's go ahead and, and expand this out a bit. So I'm going to create another message mapping and we're gonna call this request stream. And we'll return a flux in this case. If I can type flux of aircraft, um, let's see, request stream. Oh yes, come on, IntelliJ. Good, there we go. And I'm going to once again, just accept a mono of type instant. So we get this timestamp mono and yeah, let's go crazy. So return and you know what, just to, to simplify things. So I'm going to copy paste this. Uh, you know what, let's, let's mix things up. Let's change this to a different kind of clock just so we can kind of differentiate. And that's fine. Um, let's do the, let's do a couple of those just to keep it, keep it clean. And then instead of doing a then, which expects and provides a mono, I'm going to use a then many, which takes a publisher of any kind, but it produces a flux coming out. And I'm going to use the client.get once again and retrieve and we'll convert that body to a flux once again of aircraft. And that's it because we don't need to limit that. We're going to be getting back zero to n values and we're going to be sending back all of those values, however many they may be. I'm going to restart that and then we'll go over to our client and I'm going to just, uh, let's go ahead and create our next method, void request stream. And we'll once again use our requester, define the route, request rec stream, and provide the data, an instant dot now. And we're going to retrieve a flux, in this case, once again, of aircraft. And we'll subscribe to that. And let's see, we'll take the aircraft, each aircraft, and we'll uh, just kick that out. In this case, we'll do the airplane. And sure, let's do that. And once again, I'm going to Oh, come on, IntelliJ, you're killing me. Or the Mac, perhaps. Yeah, it's just a little less responsive than I'd like. I must be straining it. Hmm, that's not a, never a good sign, right? <laughs> okay, let's start that again, and we'll see what we get now. Look at that. Okay, so everything works. No big surprise, right? Things always work perfectly in live demos. <laughs> okay, well, maybe not, but it's working now. So that's a, that's a huge plus. So we have our, our single timestamp that we got, a single request with a single timestamp. And we got back, in this case, four aircraft records, right? And uh, yeah, so things are working as expected. We did our request response. We did our request stream. Let's go ahead and do a fire and forget. Define a, a message mapping for a fire and forget interaction. So message mapping we'll call this fire forget and i'm going to do this a couple ways because you can just do a void and say fire and forget and actually again we're going to get a value of some kind right so let's let's spice things up here a little i like to do this we're going to send a weather report so weather mono and of course we need to define a weather class because we don't have one of those yet so at data and class weather and in aviation, by the way, I am 
a licensed pilot. This is why I kind of get into this stuff. I geek out on this stuff. It's nice when worlds collide, uh, not planes, uh, you know, but but certainly worlds. <laughs> so so it's kind of interesting. This is uh, something I kind of geek out on and really, really get into. And yeah, it's, it's neat. Plus, it gives you a great source of live data anyway. So uh, yeah, so for weather, what we would have is... Um, uh, let's let's define a timestamp of when the observation was taken and then a string for what the observation actually is. So weather observation. Weather is very important, especially when you're flying smaller aircraft, uh, but really any aircraft, because if it's if it's too bad, if it's tur too turbulent, you can you can have injuries, you can have, you know, threatening conditions that can you know be just terrible for for trying to uh, to do anything legitimate and and come back safely. So, all right, so we're going to be receiving a weather uh, mono, a mono of type weather. So let's let's just take that weather mono and let's subscribe to that. And we'll just, uh, we'll take our weather and do, let's, let's say this is a cloudy day, which is always a little sad when you wanna fly, especially if you're wanting to sightsee a bit. So we'll grab that and yeah, that should uh, should do it, and that that's fine. I'll show you you know a, a nicer way to do that, but that gets us up and running to start off with. So I'm going to uh, just grab this, bring this down, and let's do a void fire and forget and requester dot route. I'm going to point to the fire forget forget endpoint. Provide data of new weather weather which we don't have, yes, so we need to do that here. So at data, at our constructor, class weather, private, um, instant, instant, when, private, string, observation, and then let's create a new weather observation. So instant dot now, and that's the timestamp. That's when the observation was taken, right now. And let's just say that the skies are clear Visibility is 10 statute miles. In the US, that's just how we roll, right? And I'm going to send that data, and then once again, publisher, so I'm going to subscribe, just to kick off the party, and let's send that. Now, as you might imagine, with the signature of void, we're not expecting to send anything back, we're not expecting to get anything back, and we see that the weather report came through, the weather observation came through. Now. Uh, just to be more idiomatic, I mean, typically what you, instead of having a void, you know, all the all of our signatures here are, are Reactive Streams publishers. So I'm just going to make this a mono void, right? And I'm going to return and I'm going to do on next. And then, um, then because I want to return a mono of something, I'll just do a mono, an empty mono, right? A mono void. So let's restart that. And then we'll go over here and we'll restart our client application. <laughs> and there we have it. So the weather came through and nothing came back, which is exactly, again, what you would expect to happen. So everything's working there quite nicely with the fire and forget as well. So now let's get crazy. Let's do a bi-directional channel. This is where things start getting a little bit more, well, okay, significantly more interesting. So I'm going to define a message mapping, just call it channel. I'm going to return a flux of aircraft and I'm going to, well, we'll just call this channel and I'm expecting a flux of weather observations, right? So weather flux and return. I'm gonna take that weather flux and I'm just going to, um, uh, for, for starters, I'm going to do unsubscribe and I'm gonna take that subscription and we're just going to um, just say, hey, we're subscribed to weather. So we see where we are at this point. I just think that's kind of nice. It's a nice little extra capable or capability. We're going to do on next, we're gonna take our weather reading and we'll just uh, print that out. So uh, let's see, so uh, let's make it a sunny day. Sunny days are usually better for flying, right? If they're not crazy windy. And we'll take that weather observation. And then I'm going to switch map. I'm going to take what's coming in and I'm gonna switch that up and provide a different publisher to go back. Yeah, so take weather observation and then I'm going to use my client to get and retrieve some values from our plane finder. So there we go. Look at that. Okay, that looks like it should work. 
And again, this is a bi-directional channel. So let's see what we get coming uh, from our client application. So void uh, channel requester dot route. We'll point this to channel. And let's see, so data. What data do we want to do? So I'm going to just generate some. I know that uh, you know sometimes you have to have to make some data up, and I don't have <laughs> live weather yet. Working on that. That'll be fun. So I'm going to just do this. A, a, you know, let's say once every three seconds, right? So I'm going to oh, IntelliJ. You're killing me, Smalls. All right. Love IntelliJ, but sometimes it's a little too helpful. It's better that than not helpful enough though, right? So I'm going to take that interval and that just creates a pulse. In this case, once every three seconds, it produces a long value. I'm going to map that long value to a new weather reading. Uh, Instant.now, again, will provide our timestamp. And then we need some kind of an observation. Now I'm going to, uh, just to create some observations here, I'm going to uh, just do a var. Um, yeah, that's fine. Come on, Lombok. And, and Lombok provides var capabilities. Yeah, that's fine. We'll use that. Uh, so let's see, var. Um, so we'll do obs list. So this is our list of observations. So we'll take a list of, and we'll start off with that sky's clear again, visibility 10 statute miles. And then let's uh, let's create a couple more. So let's see, we'll say it's uh, overcast at 800 feet and um, visibility of half statute mile. That's just terrible weather. Uh, and then, of course, let's go with something more like uh, broken at 2300 and visibility, um, let's say five statue miles. We still have uh, we still have VFR weather there. So, OK, and I'm going to also just create a, a new random variable random and that way we can have some fun and generate some random data here. So it's random weather data. So I'm going to do my obs list and I'm going to get a value. And I'm going to, uh, let's see, I will use random dot next int and we'll bound that by the size of the observation list. So that, let's just expand that here. Boom, there we go. So now we can see that a little better. So that's our data, right? We're gonna uh, provide that data. And then I'm going to retrieve a flux. In this case, we know aircraft are going to be coming back, a, a reactive stream, a publisher, a flux of aircraft, zero to N. And then I'm going to subscribe to that and we're going to take each aircraft. We're going to print that out and let's just uh, airplane. Uh, let's let's grab that one. And let's, again, this is going to be fun. So bring that back over, restart that. And let's see what we get. <coughs> oh, Lombok, it's a love hate relationship. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Not sure why that just sprinkled that in there, but yeah, so so be it. Oh, there we go. I was gonna say what what? Oh, it's every three seconds. I was gonna, what took so long? It's because I told it. Hey, after three seconds, start in. So yes, we we have. Uh, we're, we're sending a weather observation each three seconds, every three seconds, and we're getting back a list of the current aircraft that are in the area at that point in time that report their position at that time. So that's pretty cool, right? So, um, and, and actually I did forget to do one thing because when I close that out, it rather unceremoniously uh, spits out a trace here. So I'm gonna clean that up just a little bit because that's just ugly, right? So yeah, we can, uh, we can make this a little nicer with just a, uh, uh, a runtime hook here. So on error dropped, I'm going to take that error and just do this. So e dot get localized message. Yeah, that will work. Okay, so that makes that should make things a little bit cleaner. Now, interestingly, uh, because you know, I mean, we these are the four interaction models, and that's kind of cool, right? Uh, but it it doesn't actually speak fully to the power that our socket places in your hands and says, good luck. This is a, uh, this is really all kinds of awesome. So I created a component here at this point, I just have this, this one method that's just running and it's going to be sending data and receiving data. And that's great. Uh, but what I want to do now is just for, for giggles, I'm going to create a, another component. We'll call this our second component. And let's see, I want to inject our uh, our socket requester and once again at all our constructors so I can use that here it just injects it for me and then uh, gosh what do I want to do well I want to schedule be able to schedule something I just want to again be a little lazy and have things run for me that's nice let's make this a fixed rate of once every two seconds so 
Uh, what do I want to drop in here? Well, let's let's grab our uh, let's grab our request response. We'll just bring that down, and we'll we'll start that up in a in a separate uh, component here. Fun, fun. Okay, so let's let's do that. And every two seconds, it's going to fire this off. This component will will be created, and and every two seconds, it's going to fire off this method, and we're going to yeah, as you can see, we're going to send over a request, a timestamp, if you will, in this case, and get back a single aircraft. So we see that single aircraft. Let me just expand this. And we see that single aircraft, you know, kind of sprinkled in there. Sometimes you get it a couple times in there before the next one fires off every three seconds. But it's once every two seconds. And then, of course, once every three seconds, we get a listing of all aircraft in the area. Uh, again, and we're exchanging a uh, a weather observation for that. Now, that is pretty cool, right? Arguably, that's that's pretty nice. Let's let's do this again. <laughs> How low can you go? Uh, so let's um, let's make this our third component, and close that off. And then let's go up and grab our request stream. And let's change our rate, uh, let's say every five seconds. Now again, the, the, the one, I, I really probably haven't talked much about this, but that the, the connection that we're creating between these, these multiple services, these two services, uh, it is uh, it is resumable. So if you're going from, let's say, a Wi-Fi connection to a, a, a mobile connection, you can pick up where you left off. But it's also, and it's full duplex. So again, you can initiate uh, the conversation or, or an exchange or a simply a, a send, like a fire and forget, from either direction. But it's also multiplexed, right? So you've got all these different components that are using that same R socket connection. As you can see, we're getting kind of this variety. Oh, actually, I must have... Uh, what did I hit here? So let's see. Oh, we've got a, a problem upstream. Well, let's see what we've got going upstream with our plane finder. Oh, so let's see what happened here. Always fun. Again, live demos are great. Oh, interesting. Yes, look at this. So the value is too long for the column. Now this happens occasionally. Uh, again, the, the data comes through and, and based upon 99.99% of the data, everything is defined perfectly well. However, once in a while, there there is an airline or, or a various different air carrier, which does things just a little bit different. So the call sign in this case, something came through that's a little bit too long. Now I have this as an in-memory database, so this is pretty simple to fix. I'm just going to expand that to a call sign varcar 8 and let's go ahead and restart this, and let's get back to our, our work. Certainly nothing that you know could have been no one could have foreseen this. Uh, legitimately, nobody probably could have because, you know, sometimes you just get a weird value in or, or a legit value that you just have never seen before. So that's fine. So we're up and running here. And let's pull up our client and let's restart that. Let me expand these windows. Yeah, so the party is back on, right? So that's that's not bad. Now, have I missed anything? I've got my third component here, and that's the request stream. Yeah, I guess that's really everything. I've got my oh, I don't have a fire and forget running, do I? Well, let's let's do that. I hate to leave that one out. So that's our third component. We'll do a fourth component. I'm going to just drop that there, and there we go. And then I'm going to grab this. And it starts to get kind of kind of cool, right? So I'm, I do need to change this to fourth, and we'll make this let's say once every one second. Why not? Restart. And see, there's a nice instead of that ugly stack trace when the connection just drops out when I killed it unceremoniously. It just has a nice little note saying, "Hey, the inbound's been canceled." So yeah, we're back in business now and just sending and receiving, again, multiplexed across that single R-socket connection. So you're you're more fully utilizing resources with less trouble, with more resilience. It just, uh, it, it's so nice, so nice. Now, so far what I've, I've done is use a TCP um, connection underneath, right? So, so that is our transport at this point. But, you know, I mentioned that there was some transport independence here. So let's see what we can do. So I'm going to stop this. How hard is it to switch? 
How hard is it to switch to using something like WebSocket, for instance? Well, uh, it's just so onerous. What I have to do here on the server side is just point to this and use specify a transport, in this case of WebSocket. So I'm going to uh, restart that, and that was pretty tough, right? This is, again, this is just head-breaking tough, which is nice, right? I, I All joking aside, it, it just makes it so much more... Uh, developer focused where you can focus on the providing business value to your organization and it makes them happier it makes you happier and it just takes that you know that headache out of your uh, out of your uh, realm so I'm going to just copy this and I'm going to and change this to web socket and then what I need to do is Yuri create and I'm going to Well, come on, what happened there? My, uh, that is really weird. So, oh, my keyboard is acting up now. One moment, once in a while, I think I must smoke it or something. I just, uh, you know, get, get to stressing it too hard. The poor, poor keyboard just says, hey, give me a break here. So let's, let's retype this. So HTTP colon slash slash local host, local host 9091, right? Yeah, that should work. Let's restart that and see what we get. Oh, <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for defining that for me in, in my keyboard-induced uh, haze. Let's try that again. Oh, yes, that will make a big difference. There we go. Much happier. Computers, so literal. Okay, so we're up and running, and we're using WebSocket for the underlying transport, which is cool, right? That took, even with, you know, keyboard going crazy, unplugging, replugging, you know, dumping stuff in there that I didn't uh, see dumping in there on my behalf. Thank you so much, keyboard. Uh, that still took, what, 30, 40 seconds total? <laughs> and we've changed out our underlying transport. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we were dealing with the Plane Finder application, uh, yeah, so we're, we're feeding data from that, but we also, we already have a message mapping here. And this is why I broke this out into a controller with a response body for this, instead of just doing a REST controller, because that way I can include a message mapping here in the same controller. And since I only have two, basically two endpoints here, I, it seemed to make sense. So uh, I'm going to repoint my RSocket server I'm going to define that as an RSocket client as well, and we're going to use RSocket to go to that backing backing service, right? So that third, second hop, third service. So yeah, why not? Why not? It just seems to make sense. So how do we do that? Well, same type of thing as before. I'm going to uh, create a configuration class, and again, this is uh, you can do this multiple ways. So I'm going to call this our server config, and we'll define our bean here. And we're going to make an RSocket requester bean requester. And we'll grab our RSocket requester builder bean and return builder.tcp. In this case, it's uh, because our, our plane finder is, is um, uh, using TCP for the underlying transport. And we'll point to localhost where it's running and we'll use uh, 7635 for the port. I like to keep things consistent. So I like to have my. Uh, my port that I'm using for HTTP communication and then one after that, one increment by one and, and have my uh, RSocket port. But again, it, it doesn't matter, right? It's whatever you define it as. So uh, let's see. So I'm going to uh, inject that here. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to do a private, private final RSocket requester, requester. And I'm going to define that as a non-null field with Lombok and then use uh, if I can hit the right keys, required args constructor annotation, which again says in, instead of all args constructor, because I'm defining this here, I don't need that passed in. I don't need that as a, an injected value. Uh, what I do need injected though is, is an RSocket requester. I have that bean I'm defining here, but I need that bean here in, in my controller to use that. So I'm saying, hey, Lombok, provide a constructor with, with any, with a parameter for each uh, with for each member variable, it's defined as requiring a value. In other words, in other words, non-null. So we get our requester. So I'm going to take this, and for our request stream, I'm just going to um, we'll duplicate that, and we'll just comment that out. Yeah, it's fine. So we'll go with that, and I'm going to. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to grab this timestamp, and then I'm going to instead of using the client. I'm going to do a requester.route and I'm going to point that to AC stream. 
Swift, I believe is right. AC stream, indeed it is. And instead of retrieving, I'm going to do a, well, I'm going to send data. I'm going to send uh, just a timestamp from where we are at this point in our server. And I'm going to retrieve a flux of aircraft and pass that on. So I should have actually, uh, that's plane finder. I should have actually stopped this, but I'll, re uh, I'll stop that now. <laughs> and then I will restart our socket server. And we should have, provided I haven't, anything crazy here we should have an end-to-end -end r socket connection between or among three applications now three services instead of just the front two the first two all right so we're up and running let's go ahead and start this it starts so quickly that it's <laughs> and this is just using jvm in the uh, ide uh, restart so it's amazing uh, how fast it, even that is. So yeah, and we're back up and running. And now we're connected end to end our socket. Uh, we're actually using web socket connection between our, our socket client and our, our socket server. And then between the our socket server and plane finder, we're using a TCP connection underneath. So we're, we're basing that on the uh, TCP transport. All right. So gosh, so much stuff uh, that we could cover so much stuff that we did cover. Uh, but I think I'm going to just leave it there. I think that's kind of a neat, uh, neat place to stop. So with that, thanks for joining me. And if you're seeing this after the fact, thanks for, for tuning in and uh, checking it out. Uh, be sure to tune in next week, uh, same, same time and place, right? Uh, for uh, Wednesday afternoon's code and uh, hope to see you there. So take care and happy coding.